Well, welcome. Uh, by my calculation, this is our 232nd Heinsberg Town Meeting. So we're going to gather tonight the same way our predecessors did at a house about half mile down Silver Street in March of 1787. Pretty cool. By that point, the town was about 25 years old. And um, taking a look at our annual report this year, I can't help but notice some similarities with our original charter. Many of the committees, elected officials, bodies that were included in the town charter show up on our annual report. I'm going to read just a couple of sections from the town charter. Quoting, for instance, that with all white or other pine trees within the said township, fit for masting our Royal Navy be carefully preserved for that use. And if you take a look at page 81 of your report, you'll see the Town Forest Committee's report, where those trees once stood. Charter reads, quote, have our DRB report at page 58 and our zoning administrator at page 88. Well, finally, quote, every proprietor shall yield and pay yearly and every year forever one shilling for every hundred acres. I'll refer you to Article 3. There appear also tonight to be a number of folks that I don't recognize. I enjoy uh, calling everybody by name and for the last few years I've had just about a hundred percent success ratio calling people out by their first names but I'm seeing a lot of people I'm not familiar with so very briefly want to go over a couple of the ground rules for this evening before we call things to order a reminder that we are Let's try that again. Can I be heard? No. Does the body... Unfortunate thing is we need the microphone because this is being recorded. If you happen to go back into the archives post-1787, pre-2019, you'll find when somebody is in the audience and wants to make a point, they cannot be heard by the people listening live or the people archiving after the fact. So the microphones will have to be used when you want to make your point. Sounds as though maybe you're hearing me now. Okay. This process uh, can be tedious because we have to read, I have to read the warned articles a total of three times. So you'll be reminded that first, the article's read as it exists in the town report. I ask the body to make a motion and second it. Then it is read again, and that's when discussion is had. If the body, you folks, want to amend the existing written article, that is addressed during discussion. The person who wishes to amend has to make a motion. That motion has to be seconded. And the final voted on motion is read clearly one last time so everybody understands what it is that you are voting on. 
two more points. I would ask instead of uh, blurting out, call the question that you ask to be recognized, you make the motion to call the question. It is seconded. And if two thirds of the body wish to vote in favor of calling the question, that is when we will end debate and review uh, the article as written or as amended. Finally, um, we have this concept of unanimous consent, and I will take the liberty of asking that you give unanimous consent to the ability for any non-towns member present who wishes to speak. That may include a town staff member or a visitor that they be allowed to do so. They will not be able to vote. So unless there's an objection, I'm going to ask that we amend Robert's rules to allow non-registered voter to answer questions without requiring a suspension. All in favor of that amendment? Aye. Great. So finally introduce the select board. We have Chair Bill Pouch. Seated to his left, Andrew Morganti. Marilee Lovell, Aaron Kimball. Town clerk is Missy Ross, and our assistant is Cheryl Hubbard. And finally, our town administrator, Renee Marshall, and our assistant town administrator, Joy Grossman. So the legal voters of the town of Hinesburg, Vermont, are hereby warned and notified to meet at the Champlain Valley Union High School Auditorium in said town of Hinesburg, Monday, March 4th, 2019 at 7 p.m. to transact business on all articles except Article 1, which will be voted upon by Australian ballot on Tuesday, March 5, 2019. Australian ballot voting will occur at the Town Hall at 10632 Vermont Route 116 in Hinesburg with the polls to open on March 5th at 7 a.m. and close at 7 p.m. If necessary, the March 4th meeting may be adjourned to the Hinesburg Town Hall at 9 a.m. on March 5th to conduct any business left unfinished on March 4th. So drawing your attention to Article 2, to hear the reports of the officers of the Town of Hinesburg and take action thereon. Is there a motion to bring that to the floor? Second. Motion on the floor is to hear the reports of the officers of the Town of Hinesburg and take action thereon. I will wing it. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, I came up good. Just curious, uh, you know, I imagine for some people, it's they've come to town meeting for many years. And then others, this could be their first town meeting. Um, and I would make a point that it's a special town meeting. Um, because somebody here has been at town meeting for 27 years on the select board. <laughs> and with that, I would like to
I know that Andrea didn't want us to do this, but in a way, I felt I wanted to do it for myself just to recognize her. Um, at our first uh, select board meeting following the election, um, I plan to uh, bring up a motion uh, at that meeting, um, and I'll read to you what that motion will be. It's a proclamation. Um, whereas Andrea Morganti has retired from her leadership position as a member of the Select Board of Heinsburg, Vermont, after 27 years of dedicated service, and whereas Andrea exemplifies the best attributes of small town democracy by encouraging and bringing all opinions into respectful discussion, thereby demonstrating we are stronger as a town when we respect all points of view. And whereas Andrea considers protection of our natural resources a shared responsibility and helped co-found the Heinsberg Land Trust along with the Lewis Creek Association, which has brought our residents together for the common good of preserving our town's priceless natural resources. And whereas Andrea articulated a vision and chartered the development of sidewalks and recreation paths throughout our town to connect our neighborhoods and provide safe and healthy access to our schools, library, recreation fields, and town resources. Now, therefore, in recognition of Andrea's exemplary service to the Heinsberg community and the profound impact of her work, which is, uh, that the impact her work has had on the lives of Heinsberg residents, the Heinsberg Select Board, with deepest gratitude and continuing esteem, hereby will dedicate the pedestrian footbridge spanning the Mechanicsville Canal adjacent to the Mechanicsville Road in honor of Andrea Morganti. So I will present that. And I'll encourage the other select board members to vote yay. Um, so uh, at this, this report, I'll, we'll go over the budget briefly. Um, it's almost a 2.8% increase. We'll cover some of the highlights there, but obviously more discussion in the individual warned articles. Um, we'll talk about some key town employees and volunteers. Um, we'll touch on some highlights of 2018. Um, and we'll touch on some of the challenges going forward for our town. Uh, just recognize Kimberly Provost for the artwork on our town report. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and we did mention everybody here, and I think all the department managers are also here from the town. Um, um, this is just a little pie chart of the basic increases in our budget this year, um, the wages, we've got a 3% increase uh, for wages, which we will we put in our budget, but the final decision and vote on wages happens later on in the year by the select board. Um, the obvious health benefit insurance increases, which we've seen um, everywhere for the last many years. Um, some buildings and facilities, some increases in that budget, which primarily um, this year we're really trying hard to uh, squirrel away some capital savings for ex expected expenses coming up um, and to take care of the infrastructure we already have. So in buildings and facilities, we've put some capital savings uh, to maintain our buildings, the town hall, our sidewalks and equipment to help maintain that stuff. Um, the police budget's gone up a bit to pay for some vehicles that were previously voted for um, and some capital savings toward equipment in the future. Um, fire has increased primarily because the number of calls, uh, those would be medical uh, assistance calls, has gone up. Um, highway, uh, there's some new building costs and some additional costs for salt and whatnot. Um, and uh, Conservation Commission has a 
increase this year to conduct a natural resource map. This is a two-year project, which is um, going to be utilized by the town um, planning and zoning and whatnot. <clears throat> Some of the uh, increases were offset by a couple of good fortunes. Um, our dispatch costs, which have been discussed for many years, the what we pay the town of Shelburne to dispatch fire and police, we actually got that reduced by seven and a half thousand um, dollars. We are we've taken some capital transfers from some of the budgets, a uh, highway and fire to help reduce any increase or help reduce those budgets, um, and we've made some progress on some insurance, not the health side, but property liability workers comp has gone down, and I want to thank the town. Uh, department managers, the town administrator for working on a safety committee for the last two or three years to help reduce those worker uh, comp costs and also make the um, our working environment safer. Uh, this is an overall pie chart of the entire budget in pie sections. Um, and the ratios between things really haven't changed over the last couple of years. Um, the highways, 26%, about a quarter of our budget. Police, um, about 14, 15%. Fire and rescue, 8%. Um, we show the debt here as a smaller piece. Um, and that's well within uh, guidelines on what a town should have for debt. We're way below uh, any, where there's no concern there. Um, that debt primarily um, is the new town garage, the police building, um, and the solar uh, farm that was purchased. Um, and the small one, which I think is curious, the inter intergovernment one, that primarily is Green Mountain Transit. Um, we're a member of that uh, organization, and we pay a fee to have the bus come through town. Um, this doesn't discuss, this is the budget, the expenses, so on the income side, um, there is income associated with some of these groups. For example, the library and the fire department have um, nonprofit funds that they utilize and they put that towards some of their budgets. Um, I think in the last couple of years they've been very open uh, to the select board sharing where their costs are and, and how they're utilizing that money, so it's a real partnership there. Uh, recreation, about 75% of their budget is covered by user fees, so um, um, that's a good, good point to make. Um, this year we plan to use about, a, a, well, we plan to use $125,000 from our fund balance. Um, we have a policy on what we want to have in our fund balance. Right now it's very healthy. We're well within our policy guidelines, so we're able to apply some of that this year. Uh, and on the revenue side, um, coming up and working on the budget, we were pretty conservative, conservative on uh, the grand list, how much we expect that to grow, conservative on some of the other items, just to make sure uh, the budget we present is one we can stand behind. Uh, I think the last couple of years, we've talked about some real dedicated Employees' chief costs will retire this year, I think. Um, and um, he's uh, really been uh, great as far as the timing of when he retires. He hasn't set a specific date um, helping us as we uh, have, are starting our search for a new chief. Um, and he's not going anywhere, so he'll continue to be here and uh, support the town. Cheryl Hubbard uh, is planning to retire at, toward the end of this year uh, after 22 years of service. <laughs> Last year I said Marie Gardner was planning to retire. Well, she has retired. But I, I would note that she did so after the whole assessor department 
and processes were totally ready to hand off. Um, so that was much appreciated. Um, <laughs> Missy's got 20 years in the town hall um, and probably will continue as our clerk and treasurer if she gets elected next year. And I mentioned John Alexander, Bart Sherman, they work for buildings and utilities, but primarily their work is in water and wastewater, which is not part of our budget today. Um, but um, they're down, they got a three-man crew, and they're down one person, so they are really working hard um, to keep things within the town running, and I think that um, some recognition there would be, be appropriate. <laughs> Well, it's not too often you get a picture of Mike Anthony smiling uh, and, and, and wide awake. But uh, we did dedicate the town uh, garage, the new garage building. I'm sure everybody's driven by and seen it. Uh, we did dedicate it to Mike for his 37 years worth of service to this town. Um, the... So this is a big project that was completed on time, on budget. Um, I like to say we're good for 50 years with this town garage. Um, it will allow us to maintain a lot of expensive capital equipment we have and to properly maintain it and, and keep it. Um, and the garage, too, and the whole site provides a lot of good environmental benefits. Um, um, and We'll note that the CSWD uh, has not come back yet, um, but the site was designed around them coming back, the stormwater permits around them coming back, um, and I think it's been explained our timeline for them is a little different than their timeline. So they continue to get ready to come back, and, and it's our intention that they do come back. That's probably our number one question we get. Uh, the fire and rescue team, I think, deserves some recognition this year. Um, do that. <laughs> they had their 75th anniversary. They promised us a good parade, and Al, you came through with a good parade. Uh, they had a nice open house and a recognition uh, celebration. Um, and it really is a strong reflection on, on that, that group, that very strong group of volunteers. Um, they also were awarded the Vermont EME, EMS Star of Life Award this year. So, um. And I think, you know, we say fire department, and for 75 years they've been the fire department, but really... Um, 75% of their calls are medical response. Um, so they really are, have transitioned over the last 25 years to become an EMT response group of volunteers. Um, and that will continue as our population ages and as more uh, growth happens in the town, that, that piece of their uh, responsibility will grow. Some of the highlights, um, this year we began to allocate more water for some local development. Um, we had a couple of years where we were unable to because we didn't have the water to allocate, but um, the group, uh, John and Bart's group, uh, worked on fixing a number of significant leaks in the system. Um, and also, we're, uh, when somebody uh, hooks up to the water, we have to allocate X amount for the number of bedrooms or whatnot. That's a state requirement. But after a, a year of demonstration, we can see the amount that actually gets used is much less because we all have water-saving toilets and water-saving devices. So that allows us to reallocate more water. And we were able to do that. Um, 
The North Sidewalk project, uh, after more than 10 years of, of planning, um, that one, it will go from, McCann from Commerce Street to the NRG building on uh, the east side of 116. Um, so that should start, we expect, this year. Um, something close to me is VCAM. We moved our, our meetings from the large room upstairs in the town hall to the first floor, smaller conference room. Um, a complaint we had at many of our meetings was people couldn't hear very well. The acoustics in that upstairs room was very poor. So by moving down there, it really was a good idea because people can hear better. The, um, the VCAM... Uh, show is much better, um, and the setup and takedown is much simpler. So that was a, a good, good decision and suggestion. We updated several ordinances, um, some of the speed limits around the town. The ordinances were updated so that um, they can be enforced better. Um, we put in an, an ordinance on, uh, for, on alarm systems to help uh, reduce the number of false alarms we were getting in the middle of the night and to respond better to alarms. And we updated some zoning um, um, rules, uh, primarily some housekeeping and some suggestions from the Planning Commissioning and Zoning Department. And the other thing that uh, we've got some stability now with our uh, town administrator and that department. And so um, some of the town systems and policies and things like that are, are getting a little more sophisticated and a little more standardized, and, and that's a good thing. So if we have some zoning regs, we can find them easy and they're well controlled. Here's a shot of uh, some folks having fun at the Bissonette Fields. So that is basically completed. There'll always be some more work to do, but... Um, this year they had a dedication uh, for Millie's Field um, and through uh, fundraising and um, uh, some of the use of the Vermont gas um, easement funds that came in. Uh, primarily the fields have been completed so they'll be in full use this year. And this, I like this picture because it's just some knuckleheads that decided to go play some wiffle ball and, uh, and we have a place where you can go do that, um, and along with uh, organized sports that we expect to see there. The fundraising continues by a number of um, folks, um, and so um, I think we'll continue to see that facility get better and better every year. So, and if you haven't been there, it really is a beautiful site. We have a few challenges. Uh, wastewater treatment um, permit was given to us last year by the state, um, and it right now our wastewater treatment system can't meet those permit uh, requirements. Primarily, low, much lower phosphorus um, and ammonia. Um, so this is going to be a challenge. While not everyone's on the wastewater system, the majority of the people, everybody in the village is. All of our businesses are commercial, and so um, it's something we're going to need to work on. We're in the process of uh, redesigning the system. We have an existing lagoon system, which works very well, but it's unable to meet the, the most stringent uh, requirements we now have. Uh, we have an active committee that's working on that. Um, expect a bond vote. The ambulance service, after I think 50 years of service by St. Mike's, they are pulling out of Heinsburg, not because they want to, because they are having increased calls everywhere, and they have to constrict a little bit to meet those calls, because we're not the only one they serve. Um, and we've talked about the fact that we are having increased number of calls, and we're just beginning the process to explore what our options are. Obviously, one option might be to get our own ambulance, um, but there are other options, too, and so we'll encourage people to participate 
as we look forward to, you know, how do we address this? Um, they're they're going to leave in 2020, so we have a little bit of time. Um, we talked about being able to allocate more water, but we have um, limited quantity of water for our water system, and we do need to expand. We are now in the process of um, working a partnership with a local developer. There's a very promising well that we are exploring and going through the permitting process. Uh, it's a great spot because it's very close to our water um, building where we treat the water. Um, so we'll continue to work on that. Hopefully that will come to fruition. We talked about the CSWD drop-off center. We want to return. And then I think, you know, what's uh, been, there's a lot of discussion about the Hannaford permit. Uh, first go around, they were permitted by the DRB. This go, go around, they weren't. Um, and so we can expect there'll be a lot of legal things going on around that. Um, it becomes, it is a divisive uh, issue for our town. And I imagine it will be going on for a couple more years. So thank everybody for coming. Um, and again, I'd like to note that we have a lot of hardworking employees and volunteers in this town, which really makes the town. They're out there 24-7, plowing and sanding, uh, fixing leaky water systems, um, going to every emergency, a flood, a storm, a fire, an accident. They're, they're going to come to our aid. We have a lot of great volunteers that improve the quality of, the, of our life here in Heinsburg, whether it's fixing trails, working on affordable housing, helping develop business, good planning for our town, um, animal control. I mean, they're the whole gamut. So thank you for all of them for making this town really a, a nice livable town. I'd like to say the board appreciates everyone's input um, and we you know seek your input when we run into questions on what to do um, and we definitely appreciate respectful dialogue and discussions thank you unless there's some questions <clears throat> Wait, there's more. There's more. Sorry, I forgot to mention. So Tom Ayer is not here today. Um, he, uh, because of the bad weather in New Jersey, his flight was delayed. Um, so he did talk to us and, you know, was sorry he couldn't be here. Um, I thought I was feeling sorry because I thought he was stuck in New Jersey, but he's actually stuck in Costa Rica, so I'm not feeling sorry for him. <laughs> and if we do have any particular actions and things like that, we'll be putting it on him this time. <laughs> Well, as a reminder to all, we are on Article 2, and it sounded from what I heard from behind the wall that there's no further discussion. Does anybody want to make a point as to what they heard on Article 2? Are you ready for the vote? Okay. Article 2, to hear the reports of the officers of the town of Heinsburg and take action thereon. All in favor? Very good. Anybody opposed? All right, so now we move on to the work. Focusing your attention on Article 3. Shall the town appro approve excuse me, a general government budget of $1,808,181 with the estimated sum of $1,364,064 appropriated from property taxes to defray the general government expenses of the town. Is there a motion to bring the article to the floor? And a second, please. 
The article on the floor to be discussed shall the town approve a general government budget of one million eight hundred eight thousand one hundred eighty one dollars with the estimated sum of one million three hundred and sixty four thousand sixty four dollars appropriated from property taxes to defray the general government expenses of the town. Any discussion? Not seeing any raised hands. It appears, unless anybody wants to make a last minute point, we're ready for the vote. Motion on the floor. Shall the town approve a general government budget of $1,808,181 with the estimated sum of $1,364,064 appropriated from property taxes to defray the general government expenses of the town? All in favor? All opposed? The ayes have it, and the motion passes. Article 4. Shall the town approve a highway department budget of $1,014,991 with the estimated sum of $877,491 appropriated from property taxes to defray the highway expenditures of the town? May I have a motion? And a second, please. Thank you, Lynn. The motion on the floor. Shall the town approve a highway department budget of $1,014,991? with the estimated sum of $877,491 appropriated from property taxes to defray the highway expenditures of the town. Any discussion? Hey, we have a microphone. Thank you, Tom. Hello. There you are. Hello. No. Um, <laughs> I would like to personally thank the Heinsberg um, Highway Department for doing what they have done so creatively with the roads with this crappy, crappy winter we've handed so far. I just want to say thank you. Question, uh, Richard Watts. Do you know if this budget contains enough money for painting some fog lines along some of the roads that lead into the center of, the s of our village center? And the reason I'm asking is because as a cyclist, it enhances our safety greatly to have those fog lines because it demarks the space for the car. So they're not especially expensive, but I'm just wondering if that's something the select board has thought about. Thank you. Yes. Uh, in fact, I think we increased the budget. I don't know exactly by how much, but we definitely
further discussion on Article 4? I'm going to hold you up for a second if you. I just wondered how much more. any raised hands it appears we're ready for the vote article 4 shall the town approve a highway department budget of one million fourteen thousand nine hundred ninety one dollars with the estimated sum of eight hundred and seventy seven thousand four hundred ninety one dollars appropriated from property taxes to defray the highway expenditures of the town all in favor all opposed the ayes have it and the motion passes article Five, shall the town approve the Heinsberg Community Police Department budget of $574,391 with the estimated sum of $532,891 appropriated from property taxes to defray the police expenditures of the town? May I have a motion? Thank you. Motion on the floor. Shall the town approve the Heinsberg Community Police Department budget of $574,000 391 with the estimated sum of $532,891 appropriated from property taxes to defray the police expenditures of the town. Any discussion on Article 5? Here's your ready for the vote. Article 5. Shall the town approve the Hinesburg Community Police Department budget? Oh, we have one. Mr. Watts. Tom, can I trouble you to run? Um, that the percent of the town budget allocated to police services has been about the same over the 27 or so years, or, and I'm not sure about that, but. I just wanted to make an observation that it looks to me like about the highway budget, the police budget is about half of the highway budget. Now, probably some of that is federal funds, I don't know, but it's the same story that we've talked about in this town a few times that the that seems a lar lot of money that has been allocated to the police department over time, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I have a curiosity question about um, the black cruiser that we have in town, and this may or may not be the, the right place to ask that, but when we decide to buy new police vehicles and we decide what they look like and how they're outfitted and how we carry on community policing, I was curious about how the decisions made as to what type of vehicles we purchase and kind of the presence that we see when we travel through the town and we have what looks like an undercover vehicle to me. Um, it doesn't feel as community policed as to me. So I'm just curious like how that decision is made and if there is a process for 
that in, in the benefits of having a police car that is so, you know, undercover like that that we have in our town. And that's just my, um, my take on what that, it might not be undercover, but I'd just like to hear a little bit about that in terms of s spending budgetary money on something that's a little more militarized to me than just a community police car. Thank you. The decision on our vehicles <clears throat> is basically my decision on how we outfit. But when we came up with the decision that we were going to have, we have four cruisers, three are fully marked, and you're right, we have a, a black Ford. Uh, after discussions with the staff, the ones that are primarily out on patrol, it was decided that just due to the nature of, of the way uh, crime sometimes happens or whatever, it's nice to have a vehicle that doesn't stand out as much as the rest. And we haven't really used it. It's not as undercover as you think. Uh, <clears throat> pretty much everybody knows, but it's just a little bit better for those times when maybe we want to watch something or uh, maybe some traffic enforcement with the people that are pretty good at spotting the other ones but are, are doing things that they shouldn't be doing because they don't think there's a police car around. So that was... Again, that was a decision of myself and the staff for that. One of the officers said, um, uh, it's hard to catch people texting when you're in a police vehicle, and this one will allow the, uh, you know, them to catch uh, folks who would maybe not do that for those 30 seconds they go by, but might be doing it uh, if they don't recognize the vehicle right away. So, I mean, I think it's worth a good question, and you're right, we would be concerned about looking militaristic, um, and um, on the surface it may not look like community policing, uh, but when, you know, I asked that question and was told that, it made me feel like, oh, that makes sense because texting is very dangerous on our streets. Two questions in the back corner, and it's a little dark. I'm sorry, I can't make out. <clears throat> Debbie Light. I have a question about the overall salary for the police budget. Um, I'm just surprised about how much of a difference it is from the fiscal year actual in 18 was 30, 341,000, and this year we're talking about 395,000. And I assume that does, it doesn't include FICA, and I assume it doesn't include other benefits. And it just seems, I, I'm wondering one, how many people is that actually? And it just seems like a huge amount of money. Um, I was thinking about how we talked about this 10 years ago when we took the initial um, federal grant for policing and we said well it was you know it was free money but you know now we're up to almost four hundred and twenty five thousand dollars in salaries and FICA it just seems like a lot for a town this size so I guess I'm wondering how many people that is and um, would this be expected to go down with a new chief or what just what is the plan for the the future in terms of our our budget Right now, our department is at six full-time equivalent positions. I have five full-time, including myself, and three part-timers that work maybe one to two days a week. Uh, this is the same staffing we've had for years and years and years. Our salaries go up because of, of cost of living and that. My, this actually didn't go up as much as it would have because we are, in fact, decreasing a little bit because of the chief whoever the new chief is, is not going to be making what I'm making. It's taken me 13 years literally to get to where I'm at right now. So it did go down a little bit. Um, the COPS grant you were talking about was a long time ago. And so we've been on, this has been pretty much our same 
staffing level for quite a while. So I'm actually kind of pleased with, with what we've maintained uh, overall. The other thing is, is uh, when you look at us in comparison to other towns, we are not out of, our entire budget is not out of uh, line with what some of the other departments, Richmond, before they lost half their people and the chief, and we're, we're consistent with the other towns. The last couple of years, about two years ago, we had good discussions with the police force, the chief, and assistant, and um, or sergeant, and um, discussed the fact they're non-union, and we looked at the costs of police officers in their surrounding towns, and we are down, you know, we're on the low side or the lowest, and so we did do some. Um, uh, smaller increases to uh, try to retain the officers we have um, and not get into um, an issue where after three or four years training a new officer, they move on to, you know, the adjacent town to make more money. They still are lower paid than the other towns in Chittenden County, um, but we've been able to retain the police officers and so I think the select board uh, went with that slightly more increase than um, cost of living in the last couple of years. Make a quick comment before we receive the next uh, comment. And that is, uh, if uh, you folks are going to be making reference to a specific dollar amount in the annual report, in addition to stating your name before making your comment, if you could direct everybody's attention to the page and perhaps line number that you're operating from. Thank you. I, um, a couple years ago, there was a, an, a, an officer got into trouble because of that uh, uh, overzealous arrest or whatever. And I'm not sure how that was ever resolved and if, if money is still coming out of the police budget to deal with that situation, or is that all taken care of now? <laughs> it's all taken care of. <laughs> Thank you. just want to make a comment about uh, when you're considering a new chief that you you would be concerned about whether or not this person uh, would be interested in purchasing any kind of military surplus equipment I would really highly recommend that you look into that and make sure that he or she is not interested in doing that at least as far as I'm concerned Well taken. Thank you for those words because that's the process we're in, in the middle of right now. So there is a committee comprised of myself and Marilee and chaired by our town administrator, Renee, with input from community members who have experience in recruiting um, police chiefs who have done it before. Uh, and we're at that point now where we are asking those specific questions. What are the qualities that we're looking for in a police chief? What are the requirements that we're looking for that a police chief have for our town? And what kind of temperament, what kind of approach to their job that they would bring? And what you're speaking to, Bob, uh, is exactly the kind of thing, the, the point, the place that we're at right now for, for that conversation. So I, I'm making notes of that specifically, and uh, we're meeting again, I believe, this week. Yep, we're, we're meeting again this week, and we'll uh, make a point to mention your name and your comments specifically. And I want to add that one of the words that's come up very often when we're talking about what qualities are we looking for in a new police chief is collaborative. We're really looking for somebody that's going to continue this community policing 
and is going to transparently work with our community and our select board. So I think those qualities kind of are antithetical to being uh, using a lot of military equipment. I would add also that the purchase and even sometimes when that equipment is um, kind of donated or gotten at low cost, I think uh, on the select board we have expressed to our chief and previous chiefs that uh, acquiring that kind of equipment really does need to come to the select board because ultimately um, we once the the department has that type of equipment um, it needs to be replaced and then it becomes an ongoing expense for um, for taxpayers and so it might be <clears throat> a, a gift in the beginning but then we're, we're on the hook for it so it's important that that um, you know those those types of uh, purchases or donations are something that are considered by the broader community I, I also wanted to point out a positive thing about the police department is that <clears throat> one of the things that we've valued about our our um, our police department and our chief is that they are trained EMT and that that's very important that we see them as uh, we have a wonderful volunteer um, fire department and EMT squad but our our officers are here um, and um, are also capable of responding in that capacity and we um, very much value that for our for our police. While we're on the subject, I just wanted to ask what, or make another comment. I know there are towns, I don't know if there are any in Vermont, but there are towns that have uh, the uh, police department, the police officers trained as uh, first responder fire uh, uh, people too, firefighters. And I think that would be a wonderful um, a wonderful thing to to have for our police department because I think usually the police are the first on the on the they're the first to respond to a lot of these calls and they're and, and consequently they're the first on the site and maybe some of those uh, if those officers were trained or some of them that would want to be were trained as uh, firefighters that say there would be uh, somebody burning garbage illegally and it got out of hand or something uh, that could be put out probably fairly easily without having to call the volunteer fire department so I I would uh, I would uh, hope that maybe at some point in the future that uh, we might consider that if there are officers that would be interested in in being trained as uh, firefighters as well leader of that department right now, Chief Koss, is such a person. So he is on both uh, teams. Um, and that's a great example of, of that collaborative approach that Marilee was just speaking to. Uh, additionally, I will point out to the tremendous amount of training that goes into both roles. And, um, and again, Chief Koss can speak to the strike and Chief Barber as well, the amount of hours that go into um, staying certified at the different levels for different individuals and that's one of the beauties of our in, in our in our fire department is that you can enter into the ranks of our fire department at any level that you choose if it's uh, just a bare minimum support uh, with minimum training or all the way up to the fire chief um, and it's all a, a lot of it has to do with the training so balancing continual training and actually doing the job is always uh, an act of uh, appropriateness. Um, but your point is well taken and, and I do look right to Chief Koss as an example of what you're, you're uh, illustrating. And at, at, I, don't, I don't know if we will be lucky enough to get a future police chief that also wants to be a volunteer fire department, but basically we do want them to be EMT trained so that they can help out that way. Um, Barbara Shapiro, Chief Koss has been very 
generous and gracious in helping Vermont Dog Rescue this couple years about allowing us to have the puppies arrive at the, the police station, especially in the winter. This has been very valuable. So if you're looking for a chief, perhaps someone who really enjoys dogs. <laughs> All right. You missed my earlier comments. <laughs> Article 5 reads, shall the town approve the Hinesburg Community Police Department budget of $574,391 with the estimated sum of $532,891 appropriated from property taxes to defray the police expenditures of the town? All in favor? Any opposed? Hearing none. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. <laughs> Article 6. Shall the town approve the Heinsburg Fire Department budget of $311,939 with the estimated sum of $271,939 appropriated from property taxes to defray the fire expenditures of the town? A motion, please. Thank you. A second. Motion on the floor. Shall the town approve the Heinsburg Fire Department budget of $311,939 with the estimated sum of $271,939 appropriated from property taxes to defray the fire expenditures of the town? Any discussion? Carl. Ballot, but I wonder if this is a good time. I've been reading there's some future potential new fire station with so many voters here. I didn't know if this would be a good opportunity to just hear that sort of projection and where we're going and how we should be involved or not involved. I think that your question is consistent, Jermaine, with the uh, motion on the floor. So turn to Chief Barber. Don't run away, please. Even if it's, <laughs> even if it's an easy out. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, so, I guess, well, it's an awful big story, and I'm going to try and make it real short. So, um, one of the things that drives what we do, obviously, is the number of calls, and that drives the budget. Um, last year, and you're going to probably be kind of amazed about this. We had uh, 446 calls between fire and EMS. Um, to date, now this starts July 1, today we're at 336 calls. 73% um, are EMS calls. Um, so, you know, last year we were over budget a little bit. I know we increased our budget this year, and I'm sure just by sheer numbers, we're going to be over. We've done a lot of work to change the way we respond, so I think that'll help offset some of it. But where that gets to is um, about the building. Um, we've, truthfully, we've just, you know, we've outlived the space that we're in. We've looked at so many things over the years. Um, obviously, we looked at the combined public safety building. Um, We've looked at doing additions on the current station. We're looking at other buildings. We're looking at other properties. And it doesn't have so much to do with an ambulance or where we end up with that. It's just a matter of sheer space to do the training and to do the first response. Um, you know, it takes quite a lot of space. Today, you know, anybody that goes by there on a Wednesday night realizes what our parking situation is. We park across the road, we park at the police station, we park at Juro's, you know, we park everywhere. So we're extremely fortunate that we have 52 members in the department right now, which is absolutely unheard of around this area, or even in the state, to have that many volunteers in a volunteer department. So, you know, it's a matter of numbers and space, and, you, you know, you've got to have the room. 
safety wise inside the building we can't open the doors on both trucks at once because there's not room to walk between them so you know it's just an evolution of where we're at and you know the the firemen's association which is another part of the fire de- i don't want to say part of the fire department because it's not the firemen's association actually built the building we're currently in in 1972 and then the, the addition that was put on in 99 was also funded by the Firemen's Association through fundraising. So we really need to get to a point where we can have enough space for future growth. Um, it really won't be a growth of vehicles because we pretty much have the firefighting number of vehicles we need. It's changing what the vehicles are, yes. And then down the road, I think it's, it's absolutely inevitable that we'll have an ambulance here. Um, you know, there's a lot more to go into this conversation, obviously. Um, you know, I've known for quite a while that St. Mike's was looking at having to reduce their numbers. Um, you know, it, if you saw my article in the record this week, you know, St. Mike's, 50 years of service for basically doing it for the cost of, you know, what they can build now. The unfortunate part is we can't bill. So fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year, that budget goes just towards EMS response. So, you know, we're not able to get reimbursed for that. Um, you know, we've looked at other I've started conversations with the other ambulance services around. They want a con well, many of them want contracts to come to Heinsburg. We won't be able to realize the great benefit that we've had from St. Mike's for all these years, not really charging us anything since I've been able to build. So, you know, please, if you have questions, because we, you know, we're going to have a lot of conversation about this, obviously, um, send your questions to info at HeinsbergFD.org. Um, and, we're, you know, we're going to get it publicized so we can talk about the ambulance and have a lot of conversation about that. But, you know, it's it's really a matter of care. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. Did that answer your question, Carl? Yeah. Bill. Yes. Uh, well, the Park Board plans to be involved in this. This is a big, you know, a big transition that is coming. Um, and it is coming, not only St. Mike's, but so, for example, a developer is proposing... Um, a new building with 50 elderly, uh, for, for 50 elderly housing. Um, and that in itself is going to, you know, have a number of calls um, and just uh, continue that increase in medical calls that we expect as the town grows a little bit and as it ages. So it is something we want to be careful about what we do and very thoughtful um, but we do need to take some some type of action. Laura. Phil, since you okay, Phil, since you brought it up about the impact of a possible future development having uh, elderly expected in it. Does the town have the ability to charge impact fees for developments? Yes. We currently have impact fees on uh, our fire. Uh, it, when you develop impact fees, they have to go to specific um, departments or capital in, uh, infrastructure needs that would be associated with development. And so uh, our current impact fees uh, do go to fire. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Greg Matthews. I'm the town walker. I'm out in the hours of darkness, so what I say, if you get mad at me, you can hit me. And I, nobody will even know until it's over. <laughs> until they smell my body in a ditch somewhere. But... I just want to make a comment that my grandfather brought me up with, and a lot of us whiter hair people might remember this one. And the select board has done a very good job of running our budget, keeping it at a minimum for many, many years. But over the last few years, and I know the need has been there, 
we've got to remember, we've got a champagne appetite in this town, and we've got a beer income. And a lot of you older people have heard that. So we've got to keep that in mind. It's great to put this new structure in, but it's got to be sustainable, and it's got to be, we've got to be able to afford it 10, 15 years from now as we get older, and our incomes drop. Well, the old people are going to have to leave this town instead of paying back the town for educating our kids. I just wanted to make that point. Any further discussion? Is you ready for the vote? <clears throat> Article 6. Shall the town approve the Heinsberg Fire Department budget of $311,939 with the estimated sum of $271,939 appropriated from property taxes to defray the fire expenditures of the town? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. Article 7, shall the town approve the Carpenter Karst Library allocation from the town of Heinsburg of $225,487 with the estimated sum of $225,487 appropriated from property taxes to defray the library allocation from the town. May I have a motion? A second, please. Thank you. Shall the town approve the Carpenter Karst Library allocation from the town of Heinsburg of $225,487 with the estimated sum of $225,487 appropriated from property taxes to defray the library allocation from the town? Any comments? Yes, in the very back corner, please. Can't see. Hi, um, Debbie Light again. I just like to say that um, we, I think, we have a really wonderful library. And if you have talked to people from other towns, which I do about the library, we have our library is so much better than most other libraries, and it's gotten even better with some of the changes that that Sarah's put in. And I just think that we, um, for the amount of money we do spend, I mean, we there's so many services you can use there. So if you haven't been to our library, um, you should really check it out. It's it's awesome. Any further discussion? Sarah. I'm Sarah. I, I'm Sarah Armstrong Donegan. I'm the library director. Um, closer. I'm Sarah Armstrong Donegan. <laughs> I'm the library director. And um, thank you, Debbie, for your kind words. That's very sweet. Um, I just wanted to take a moment. Um, Phil reminded me at the beginning of the meeting about um, recognizing some employees. So I just wanted to take a minute and recognize um, the face that you almost always see at the front desk, Judy Curtis. She has worked for us, uh, worked at the library for 25 years as of in 2018. So if we could give her a round of applause. And someone who you might not see as frequently, unless you have a tech question, um, Richard Pritsky has worked at the library for 15 years now. So thanks to both of them. Bill. I wanted to just say that um, a few years ago I decided I had plenty of books in my house and I didn't need any more. And I don't know how many of you have bookshelves full and full of books. Um, but I decided I didn't need to buy any more, that I'd rather go to the library and say, if you don't have this, can I get it on interlibrary loan? And I tell you, I'm a little embarrassed, I do that a lot. But uh, 
I really, it's a little easier to say this now that we don't have a bookstore in town, but uh, I really think the library's ability to get us what we need if we don't need to own the book uh, is really uh, a gift to each of us and a gift to the town. And so I strongly encourage us to individually support the library as well as to support the budget here at the library. Because I think, uh, well, I will at least say that I personally am plenty using it a lot. So thank you. Article 7. <clears throat> Shall the town approve the Carpenter Cars Library allocation from the town of Hinesburg of $225,487 with the estimated sum of $225,487 appropriated from property taxes to defray the library allocation from the town? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carries. Now for Article 8, unless there's an objection, I will read the complete warned article one time and then the prefatory language about the total sum before we discuss. So Article 8 in its entirety reads, shall the town appropriate the sum of $27,550 with the estimated sum of $27,550 appropriated from property taxes to be distributed as specifically designated to the following agencies and organizations. The Hinesburg Community Resource Center, amount of $13,000. UVM Home Care and Hospice, the VNA, $6,500. Agency on Aging, CVAA, an amount of $2,000. Howard Center, $1,000. Hinesburg Rides, $1,800. Vermont Family Network, $1,000. Hope Works, $200. American Red Cross, $400. Hinesburg Senior Meal Site, $650. Lund Center, $1,000. May I have a motion? And a second, please. The motion on the floor as it reads now, shall the town appropriate the sum of $27,550 with the estimated sum of $27,550 appropriated from property taxes to be distributed as specifically designated to the following agencies and organizations. Any discussion? Harry. Um, I was asked to um, propose an amendment supporting Chittenden Community Action, which is normally on this list of organizations we support. Um, and they got their request in a few days late. Um, they were requesting 1500 which was an increase over um, what we've given them in the past. I think it's been 1000 um, I I am proposing that um, since they didn't get theirs in on time, that we stay with 1000 and not um, the 1500 they were requesting. Um, but I do propose an amendment to increase the Article 8 by $1,000. That has been seconded. So the amended motion on the floor would read, shall the town appropriate the sum of $28,550 with the estimated sum of $28,550 appropriated from property taxes to be distributed as specifically designated to the following agencies and organizations, including an additional $1,000 to the list uh, on page 7. Is there any discussion of the amended article? Is there any further discussion on the article in general? Rolf? So I'm just. Does it work? Yeah. I'm just curious about um, we've normally supported COTS, the Committee on Temporary Shelter. And I'm wondering if uh, they suffered from the uh, same circumstance that uh, Harry just described. Um, is there anyone here to talk about that, possibly? The 
comment was apparently they did not apply. Same question, but steps to end domestic violence. Anybody from the committee here that can make a comment? It sounds as though steps did not apply either. Bill, did you have a comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Kathy, um, on the amendment, um, <coughs> sorry. So on the amendment, um, is there any reason the committee would, other than they were late in applying, is there any other reason the committee, you know, might not approve or would approve their request? Don't mean to put you on the spot, but. Um, I can't really um, answer for the other four people on the committee, but we have um, given to them in the past a thousand dollars, but they just didn't get their application in at the timely. Last timely, yeah. We are down a bit um, because we had four people that did not apply, or four organizations, so we did not allocate as much this year because we didn't want to have a um, exploded budget next year. Barbara Fourhour again, and my question is, uh, agency on aging, I'm assuming that the, the money that's allocated to them covers the Meals on Wheels program. They had asked me to speak to their, their need, and Heinsberg was delivered over 2,000 meals last year to residents. So I, I'm glad to see that they are in the budget and that we are supporting them. All right, motion on the floor is an amended motion that now reads Article 8, shall the town appropriate the sum of $28,550, but the estimated sum of $28,550 appropriated from property taxes to be distributed as specifically designated to the following agencies and organizations. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion that has been amended carries. And we move on. Article 9. Article 9 reads, shall the town, come right over Phil, <laughs> appropriate an estimated sum of $50,000 to be raised from property taxes for work required to modify the configuration and signal light timing of the Lampman's exit slash Charlotte Road slash Route 116 intersection for the purpose of improving traffic flow in the village. If voters approve, uh, I will just go ahead and read this once. Voters approve Articles 3 through 9 as presented. Total general fund expenditures of four million thirteen thousand five thirty. I will just read it properly. I'm sorry. Four million twelve thousand five thirty nine will be required with the estimated amount of three million three hundred forty nine thousand four hundred twenty two dollars to come from property tax revenue. So, may I have a motion to discuss Article Nine? Thank you. And seconded. Reading only the first paragraph, shall the town appropriate an estimated sum of $50,000 to be raised from property taxes for work required to modify the configuration signal light timing of the Lampman's exit Charlotte route, Route 116 intersection for the purpose of improving traffic flow in the village. May I? Phil, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, this one's... Uh, so this article... Um, we thought should get some uh, 
uh, clarification and have an opportunity for discussion. So I'll describe exactly what we're talking about and then certainly open it up for discussion. And that is the reason we wanted to put it here um, rather than in the budget. Um, well, I'll just start here. So it's 50,000 approximately. Um, the purpose of it is to uh, relocate the stop bar and the sidewalk around the Lampmans. I'll show you a drawing of it in a minute. Um, and with that, um, after doing that, we'll improve the sight distance from the exit at Lampmans. I'm sure everybody's been there. And the uh, Charlotte entrance to 116. Um, and with that improvement, then the state of Vermont, who controls 116, is willing to change the phasing of the light. Today, it's a multi-phasing, so you got 116 can go, and then the next phase is the Charlotte exit can go, or the Lampman's exit can go, and then the third phase is the Charlotte Road can go. Um, so that is, you know, those changes have to happen before the state will change the phasing of the light. It's important to note that these changes we're describing were a condition on the Hannaford's development permit to address traffic issues, um, but as we know, that has been delayed um, for a while and will probably uh, continue to be delayed. Um, the Phasing of the light, just to sort of give you some structure here. Today, um, 116 goes for 40 seconds. Then the Lampman's exit goes for 13 seconds. Then the Charlotte Road goes for 13 seconds. If the phasing goes to um, concurrent phasing, then the 116 will go from 40 to 50 seconds, 10 more seconds. And the Charlotte Road and Lampman's exit will be 16 seconds happening together. Um, so the board was reluctant to put this in the budget. Um, one, we didn't think it was a necessity. The things that are in the budget we think are important to the town for the, you know, what the town needs. Um, and this is not necessarily a need. Um, we know that it could be paid by the developer sometime, maybe. It's been discussed for years on the select board and, uh, and in front porch forum, uh, you know, traffic. Um, so we usually bring it up every year and then we go, well, we should be waiting for the developer or, you know, other things should happen. The town itself has very limited ability to change 116. That's the state, uh, right now is the state responsibility. So uh, we have to follow what they want done before we can change the timing of that light or any other light. Um, and just sort of another side note as far as traffic goes. The, this, this item was identified in a traffic study back in 2013 and again in 2015. Um, and that's what, you know, identified this as a, I'll call it an opportunity. Um, they also identified the Route 116 Charlotte light, that four-way light, as a significant, um, as an CVU road. Is that what I said? No? Charlotte, CVU Road, sorry, that intersection um, will get changed. It should get changed in the next two years, which will add turning lanes and improve the safety around that intersection. Um, so let me see if I can do this here. So um, can you see that picture up there? Um, so what we have here, this is Lantman's. Here's the Charlotte Road, the exit out of Lantman's, 116. And so today, if you're walking down the sidewalk, you're right in front of Lantman's and you cross here, this is the stop bar. Chief 
I'm going to let remind everybody, this is where people should be stopping <laughs> when you leave Lantman's. And there is no right turn allowed here. And the reason that stop bar is there is because this sidewalk is here and this building is here, and it's a safety issue. So that's why that stop bar is so far back. If the sidewalk was to be moved farther out toward 116, then the stop bar can come out farther. Then I guess the visual uh, sighting across this is better, and that would allow the traffic light to the phasing to be changed. So that's what that, this motion's all about. I'm willing to answer any technical questions on it. Should I stay off? Or? Sure. Okay. Just identify people who yep. might be wanting to speak. It looks like we have some hands. So let's try to go in some order. And um, it looks to me like it's going to be harder to turn left from Charlotte Road. And so I don't really want to spend $50,000 making it harder to get from my house under Route 116. Is that correct? Oh. All right. This looks like it's going to be harder to turn left from Charlotte Road onto 116. Am I wrong in assuming that? Um, I, I, I'm not going to say it's going to be easier, and I'm not going to say it's going to be harder. But we won't have a designated time just for Charlotte Road. That, that's correct. Okay. Well, that's the problem. The question is, there others. won't be a designated time just for Charlotte Road. If this change was to move forward, both the exit and Charlotte Road would happen at the same time. So that traffic would need to yield appropriately. Okay. <laughs> All right. That doesn't sound like a good thing for those of us who live on Charlotte Road. So. Okay. Ray, I'm going to ask you, uh, give it maybe five seconds before you speak. It seems as though there's a little delay in the pickup. I've been coming to town meeting for 55 years, and this is the worst idea I have ever heard in all of those years. <laughs> You're going to tell us that we now have 26 seconds, 13 each, to get out of Lampman's and the Charlotte Road, and decrease it to 16 seconds to do the same thing? It's hard enough to get out of those two roads as it is, and reducing it by 10 seconds is going to make it even harder. Um, I use both of those roads a lot, and I would say at least half the people make a left turn out of both of those. People making a left turn out of the Charlotte Road are going to have to wait for the people coming out of Lambs. The people making a left turn coming out of Lambs are going to have to wait for the people coming out of the Charlotte Road, and the traffic is going to back up on the Charlotte Road all the way to Charlotte. That's why they call it the Charlotte Road. Very good. Um... George, go ahead. George Damron. I, I've lived, and my wife have lived actually in the Yellow House right on Charlotte Road for 30 years. And I was involved with a lot of other people. And I know it's not the most popular thing, but I was involved with many others to try to get the light there because of the major safety issue for pedestrians. I'm going to vote against this. I think this is a bad idea, especially for people, not only motorists being able to turn, but also pedestrians and cyclists as well. I expect, and maybe I'm not thinking through the consequences correctly, but it seems to me as if the, the traffic is going to go much faster out of Lantman's than before. In one week, I saw two people turn right on, to go north on 116, which was a violation, traffic violation. We're going to have other kinds of traffic violations like running that light. Not only is it going to block motorists, but I feel like it's really going to imperil a lot of people who are walking in the center of the village. So I really would like to argue against this. Um, maybe. 
uh, Brandon Martin, and I was just wondering if the select board had considered um, a similar configuration in terms of traffic movements, but to keep the current phasing and allow right on red out of landings. Um, so, yeah, I would say that, that the state won't allow that the way it is now. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think that perhaps the state, that's a good question. I probably should have figured that out beforehand. I think if we move to this and the stop bar was moved farther out, then right on red would, I'm guessing, be allowed. In the same way the Charlotte Road, the right on red is allowed. Hello. Um, is it working? Mike Busher. Um, I want to give my opinion for this change for a couple of reasons. I have a couple of questions. Number one, I think we have a existing safety situation here because people don't stop at the stop bar and you see people walk out in that crosswalk, somebody's going to get hit there. I don't think it's a safe situation the way it exists. The second thing I'm curious about is when they do the traffic studies, this is ultimately going to improve the flow on 116. And usually there's data that says what the delay is waiting on 116. And I'm wondering if you have the data of what the improved delay would be on 116. So I, I don't have the specific data because there are many opinions on this as far as the traffic study. And, and I'm going to say, in my opinion, based on from what I've seen, um, you're probably talking about less than you're you're going to primarily speed up the traffic on 116 primarily going south in the late afternoon because that's where it tends to back up the most um, and you'll probably save and now this is just me talking I'm not a traffic expert but from what I've seen less than a minute on average Further discussion? Vicki Matthews again. Um, I've been tempted many times to do a right on red there. Many, many, many times. Um, but I haven't. Um, it seems to be the crosswalk from Lantman's to the Schlott Road, then across the Schlott Road, but there's nothing from the town road, the town hall, to that sidewalk. So if you stop any pedestrian crossing where that is now and put it further down where the town hall is and get rid of all those little squiggly lines, because anybody walking on that road is going to be meat pie for somebody. But there have been not ever any cross path from Lampman's to uh, the town hall. And I've seen many people go across 116 across the Shalott Road and have to go that way, but there's never been any crossroad right there. So stop all pedestrian coming out of Lampman's. If you can make it two lanes and, and not have cross traffic going at the same time, and I don't think it costs $50,000. Paul Amberson, and I'd like to speak in favor of at least moving the crossbar forward and allowing the right, if the right-hand turn were allowed. I got to tell you, I just don't shop at Lantman's from 2.30 on, uh, which is regrettable because I know I don't want to invest the time to try to get out from behind the building. And uh, I, too, have been tempted by the right-hand turn, and I don't do it either. But uh, I, I'm in favor of moving, the, if we could figure out a way to move that stop bar forward, I'm all for it. Maggie Gordon, uh, so the studies show that there should be, um, if we do this, there should be some reduction um, or a slight reduction in, or some, some reduction in, in uh, traffic delay um, if we do this. And the, the intersection um, at CVU Road, 
Um, I recommend that we, since since VTrans it has already scheduled, I think has already scheduled the to have the intersection at Seaview Road done. I recommend we do that, wait for that, see how that affects um, affects the traffic, and then, if necessary, move on to this um, to this improvement. But to do them both, we you know we will have no idea which one is having the having the effect. So, hi, Nancy Baker. Um, I've lived in this town um, long enough to where there wasn't a light at CVU Road, and the amount of accidents that happened. And I just see if the light allows the people from Charlotte Road and Lampman's to go at the same time. People are so impatient. I just see crashing happening. Um, I'd rather put money maybe into a camera that catches people turning right out of Lampman's and we find them and put money into, you know, a, a slight fine so they learn the rules of the road. I go to Lampman's all the time, no matter what time. And the amount of time I've sat at that light at Lampman's is negative negligible compared to having lived in New York City and uh, Westchester County. So I just think, you know, people just need to kind of calm down a little. But I do agree that if I was a pedestrian, I would be very worried about people coming out of Lampman's um, and running me over or on a bike. So there should be a fix for that. But I think that whole thing of people turning at the same time is just an accident looking to happen. <laughs> Thank you. I was just wondering what the effect on um, the driveway for the Russells would be. I can't really make that out from your little drawing. <laughs> um, so I think you've got the one. Um, from the Meads and the the Russells, I think is farther down from where the sidewalk actually would be modified. So it would have no not much on. impact there, I don't think. Uh, Richard Watts again. I want to just point out that um, pedestrians crossing, they're, because the cars are backed up so long, so sometimes for pedestrians, as someone who's walked across there, I'm not sure it's worth the money that we're spending potentially to fix it. And I want to point out, for those of you who are concerned about traffic, we will pay you 10 bucks to try the bus and we'll pay for your first four passes. And the bus leaves right from town hall in free a free parking lot. And you will see the bus riders hopping out there, trying to walk there and walk there and walk there. But if anybody, sorry, Mr. Moderator, don't throw me out of order. But if anybody's interested in trying that bus that leaves twice in the morning and twice at the end of the day, we will actually pay you through a research project to try it. Sorry to slip that in. but. Rolf here is a proud writer. Hi, I'm Peter Erb. Um, I think that there may be some unintended consequences down at Silver Street. Uh, I may be wrong about this, but in my experience when uh, down there at early in the morning, if traffic is stopped, then there seems to be a really nice, I think what's termed zipper feed. Uh, Silver Street goes and then 116 goes. And as soon as traffic starts moving, even slowly, the people on 116 seem to be much more hesitant to come to that full stop and allow Silver Street to come out. And I don't know where this has been studied, but I think it, it might just shove a problem in a different way up further uh, or down south on 116. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Russell Spees. Um, 
I just wanted to uh, to make the comment that maybe it's a little unwise to be spending um, really very much money on that intersection where there is an issue of traffic or the, or the type of traffic issue is primarily being caused by traffic coming in and out of Lantman's when at this point in time, irregardless where anybody may or may not be standing on the Lot 15 issue, we have no idea what is going to be going on on that site in the not so far future. It seems not the best decision to be spending a lot of money at that at this time until that's resolved. Tom, can you turn around? Thank you. <clears throat> One of the things I want to mention is Peter is absolutely right. If you do anything that increases the speed on 116, it will definitely affect Silver Street because you, you watch it in the morning as the traffic is backed up. Everybody just filters in Silver Street. But once the traffic starts to move a little bit faster, people are hesitant to go ahead and stop and then allow that person from Silver Street. So whether you're for it or against it, I can tell you that that will have an effect on Silver Street. Lee Bast, um, I also agree that I like on a basic level the idea of improving the visibility, but I question whether the timing also needs to change. And I also have a question, as part of this project, um, has the state or the select board asked the state about more aggressive time of day changes for the light? So, I mean, once Lantman's is closed, does that still need to be sensor-based? Could that change to just being pure throughput? I don't know if that's come up at all, but I want to know if that. I don't know if we've specifically asked them that question, but it's interesting that the um, you know late at night the um, flash the lights flash at um, uh, even at CVU 116 intersection, but <laughs> the the Lampman's one just stays constant there which seems kind of crazy because there are limited hours so there's there's a lot of um, p potential of other other uh, solutions oh because of the crosswalks yeah what I what I've observed is after a certain hour the lights there at this intersection just stay green for north and southbound 116 and if you approach it from Lantman's or Charlotte Road you get the turns so it, it the light turns to green in your lane for X amount of time, yeah, but it doesn't flash like what Chief Cost is saying. Hold. For the rec commission, uh, Tom Perry, uh, live in the village, and the one thing that I was wondering in regards to this right light restructuring, and it's been brought up about the pedestrian access. I use the pedestrian access quite a bit because I live right in the village and that is an especially long crosswalk. Would there be any, if this passes, any consideration of either shortening or maintaining the crosswalk uh, time parameters as they stand? I don't think in any of the studies they talked about um, changing the timing of that pedestrian I think they assumed it would stay the same and be activated in the same way. Appears we have an additional comment in the corner, Tom. Thanks. <clears throat> Rob Bast. Um, I just want to add to this discussion for the select boards. Uh, thinking that um, one way to always, one thing to always keep in mind is that if the town really has a series of problems that taking over the road through the village remains a possibility. That's always something that can happen on a state highway and then it becomes a different road with different rules within, within the framework of the village. So I, I would urge you to keep that in the back of your minds as you look at individual problems that are 
developing and and um, maybe there's going to be a comprehensive solution at, at some point. And I'd like to add to that. I think about three years ago, there was a study done, CCRPC study, that uh, talked about the town taking over 116. Um, and in my opinion, there were a lot of advantages there. It would be easier to put in additional crosswalks. We would have more say in how things go. Obviously, the state would still have some control, um, but you know, other towns and cities in the state have taken over their town roads. Um, and it was kind of a neutral cost, although there were some large um, long-term costs there. So for example, if we were to take over the road, um, we would have to plow it. Um, we would be given um, revenue from the state. It would be added to the roads that we do get revenue now, um, grants to take over roads that would add to that level of grant for that road. Um, but if a light was to go bad, the CVU light, um, if we own that part of the, the road, we would be responsible to fix it. But um, in my opinion, it's definitely worth us having another good discussion on the 116 and the benefits, um, the, the pluses and minuses associated with taking over and taking responsibility for that road. Because these kind of questions, um, we wouldn't be so much under the thumb of the state telling us what we have to do to change timings of lights and improving uh, circulation of pedestrians. Any further discussion on Article 9? Does not appear so. Follow up? So just to be clear, Article 9, the timing and the sidewalk as Article 9 stands are, are inseparable. They're both, it's a combined package deal. Well, I, I would suggest that an amendment could be made in people feeling like the sidewalk situation and the stop bar um, needed to be changed to improve uh, visibility. Um, we could do that and then and not ask the... Um, state to change the signaling, but just do uh, the change uh, in the sidewalk, which is kind of what I've heard from the audience, is that people do recognize that there is a safety issue with the, um, um, with the, the alignment of the sidewalk and the stop bar. So we would be looking to um, voters if somebody wanted to make an amendment or a suggestion on what you wanted to do or As a reminder, you have the ability to modify this within certain parameters. The germaneness of the issue has to remain the same. Um, but as Andrea has indicated, uh, if, there wish, if you wish to have further discussion on potential amendments, this is the appropriate time to do so. Ray? Okay, I lied before. It's been 45 years. But uh, that's the best idea I've ever heard, is um, realign the sidewalk and don't change the timing. And I understand that, from Andrea, that that's a possibility. So I would like to amend this um, article that we move the sidewalk and the stop bar and do not change the timing of the lights. So what I'm hearing from you, Ray, is a modification to strike the language end signal light timing such that the article would now read, shall the town appropriate an estimated sum of $50,000 to be raised from property taxes for work required to modify the configuration of the Lampman's exit Charlotte Road, Route 116 intersection for the purpose, and here we have the same language still, of improving traffic flow in the village. Are you, Ray, suggesting changing the language to indicate for the purpose of improving safety at the exit of Lantman's? Okay. 
So the amended motion on the floor would read, shall the town appropriate an, est appropriate an estimated sum of $50,000 to be raised from property taxes for work required to modify the configuration of the Lantman's exit Charlotte Road Route 116 intersection for the purpose of improving safety at the exit of Lantman's. Is there any further discussion? Yes, please. Hi. I'm sorry. Uh, very correct point. Uh, so I would need a motion from the floor uh, to discuss the amended language. Thank you. And a second? Okay. We'll jump into the discussion. Hi, oh. I'm Catherine Lavasser, and my question is, do, if we amend the motion, does that give us the ability to prevent the state, for example, from mandating that the traffic patterns change? Well, um, I would have to inquire of Phil's. It, it, it's hard for me to speak for the state, but they uh, are most concerned with moving traffic through our town and less concerned about, in my opinion, about the environment within the town. So they measure their success on how many cars get through and, and what the, the timing that it takes. I mean, they are concerned about safety too, but. Um, I'm Debbie Dameron, I live on Charlotte Road. I'm just gonna wait for a pickup, Deb. Um, I have a question, I have a couple questions about what we're voting on now because are we saying still $50,000, but we're just gonna deal with the sidewalks? Are we talking about sidewalks on both sides of 116? I think this is moving a little bit fast and I may be voting for something not realizing what I'm voting for. So I'm a little uncomfortable with the, the amendment without understanding it better. Well, um, that's a very fair point to make. So let's be clear about what motion is on the floor. And if I may repeat it so you understand clearly what has been suggested, okay? Shall the town appropriate an estimated sum of $50,000 to be raised from property taxes for work required to modify the configuration of the Lampman's exit, Charlotte Road, Route 116 intersection for the purpose of improving safety at the exit of Lampman's? That is that was the amended motion. That's what we're discussing now. Tom Perry again. Um, so, would the budget change? Uh, is it going to cost fifty thousand dollars to just move the sidewalk and and the stop bar? Uh, would that be a significantly less cost than uh, lower cost than doing the whole intersection? Please, Phil. Uh, yeah, so just to clarify a couple things, uh, speaking for the select board, um, the cost of $50,000, the estimated cost, um, is just to move the sidewalk and change the stop bar. That is nothing else. So if the amended, this amendment was to go forward, um, the recommendation to the select board would be that's the action we would take. And, and while I walk, and I'm now I'll speak for myself as a citizen, while I walk this and I bike that area, and that is not a very good uh, design for a sidewalk in Lantman's, and I agree, it's not as safe as it could be. Um, in my opinion, if the town wanted to spend $50,000 to improve safety uh, for pedestrians, bikers, and whatnot, I would want to take a look at the entire village and see what other spots we have that also could be improved for safety. Uh, you know, this motion really was, um, and the select board was reluctant to put it in the budget, and this discussion is very good. This is exactly what we were looking for. Um, this motion was to address what we hear complaints about, and that's traffic. 
and I would, I would add to that uh, point that you're making about safety in the village as a whole, that equally, in my mind, if not more perhaps, the intersection at 116 and Silver Street, and especially in the morning at school time, especially, which is different than what we're talking about tonight with, 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 with our intent, our, the select board's intent of putting this motion before you. It is really important to know that the genesis of this was that people wanted to improve traffic, the north-south traffic um, flow and um, uh, exiting of Lantman. So that's really, and, and we just, that's why it's there. Yeah. George. Uh, this is George Dameron again. Very briefly, I am sorry if I disagree with my, my friends um, Ray and and Andrea, perhaps, with regards to this amendment. As the, the chair of the First Village Steering Committee for many years, I was on that committee, and we did a lot of thinking about sidewalks and traffic. And one thing I felt like I learned is that there are enormous amounts of unintended consequences for any particular decision made. And you all have made that point very well many times. Any decision that's made to do any small change to traffic patterns, and so I'm very reluctant. I will still vote against the amendment, and I'll vote against the emotion because I don't think, from the floor of this this particular uh, gathering, that we should be making decisions that could have major unintended consequences, both in terms of traffic flow, Silver Street, pedestrian uh, pedestrian safety as well. Kath. Catherine Goldsmith, can the um, select board tell us the history of when the state was asked for permission first to do this? I'll go to the historian. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Phil mentioned a 2013 study, but I think it was prior to that that um, people started talking about that um, uh, prior to that, probably more like 2010 or something. Um, so probably, I don't know, people have been complaining about traffic ever since the light went in. So. <laughs> Which was 07, right? Yeah. So again, this is Mike Busher speaking. Um, I think there's been a lot of good questions brought up. This recommendation, to my understanding, was made before the Hannaford's application. It was a safety issue brought up before that situation, and there are experts that have made this recommendation. And there's a lot of questions that are coming up and a lot of good questions, and I think those experts are probably available to answer those questions without us making uninformed decisions on those questions. Again, I just wanted to point out that it's not a Hannaford thing. It was a safety issue and a traffic issue brought up prior to that. And I think it would be to our benefit if the, amend if the motion is changed to not say it's going to be, we're going to have the Charlotte and the Lantmans execute or not queued together, but maybe to do a little bit additional work with the traffic engineers to really answer the questions that are being brought up tonight. Vicki. You, you, you do. You do. Um, I definitely will vote against the amendment. I will vote against the thing. Uh, the actual article, I think we should table this whole article till next year and within a year we can find the answers to a lot of questions even the select board has a lot of questions on the safety of all this so I'd like to can I amend the amendment or no the issue would be whether to uh, approve or disapprove the amended motion that's on the floor I'll wait thank you Further discussion, Tom?
Pat Maynard. Uh, quick question. If Hannaford comes to town, would Hannaford pay for this either way? Uh, would they reimburse us, or are we spending our money and we don't get reimbursed? Uh, so two questions there. Um, if we spend our money, uh, don't plan on being reimbursed. Um, number two, would they, even if Hannaford's came, we know this is probably going to court. Um, it may be an item they, um, it's a condition on their permit. It may be a condition they fight in court. We don't know. So I'm hearing a motion to call the question. Is there, oh, we have another. Yep. So as I was saying, uh, it sounds as though there's a motion. I need a second. And uh, I want to hear all in favor of calling the question. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it, so the discussion is ended on Article 9, and I will read Article 9 for your vote for or against. Shall the town appropriate an estimated sum of $50,000 to be raised from property taxes for work required to modify the configuration of the Lantman's exit, Charlotte Road, Route 116 intersection for the purpose of improving safety at the exit of Lantman's, all in favor of the amended motion. All opposed. No. The nays have it. The article fails. We move on. <coughs> Excuse me. Article 10. Yes, please. My apologies. Thank you. Now. The original article, I will put to you, shall the town appropriate an estimated sum of $50,000 to be raised from property taxes for work required to modify the configuration and signal light timing of the Lantman's exit, Charlotte Road, Route 116 intersection for the purpose of improving traffic flow in the village. All in favor of the original motion. All opposed to the original motion. Nay. Appears again that the nays have, and Article 9, as originally written, fails. Thank you. Article 10. Shall the voters authorize the select board to borrow money when needed to meet current expenses and indebtedness of the town of Hinesburg? May I have a motion? Thank you. And a second. Motion on the floor. Shall voters authorize the select board to borrow money when needed to meet current expenses and indebtedness of the town of Hinesburg? Is there any discussion? It appears not. Article 10. Shall voter voters authorize the select board to borrow money when needed to meet current expenses and indebtedness of the town of Hinesburg? All in favor? All opposed? The ayes have it. Article 10 passes. Article 11. Shall voters authorize the payment of real and personal property taxes for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020, payable in full to the town of Hinesburg in one installment, with the due date being November 15th, 2019? Any and all payments received in the town treasurer's office later than midnight on November 15, 2019 will be considered delinquent and will be subject to the collection of interest at the rate of 1% per month or fraction thereof for the first three months and thereafter at the rate of 1.5% per month or fraction thereof. I have a motion. Second. Thank you. Motion on the floor. Shall voters authorize the payment of real and personal property taxes for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2020 payable in full to the town of Hinesburg in one installment with the due date being November 15, 2019. Any and all payments received in the town treasurer's office later than midnight on November 15, 2019 will be considered delinquent and will be subject to the collection of interest at a rate of 1% per month or a fraction thereof for the first three months and thereafter at the rate of 1.5% per month or a fraction thereof. Any discussion on Article 11?
ready for the vote. Article 11, shall voters authorize the payment of real and personal property taxes for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020, payable in full to the Town of Hinesburg in one installment, with the due date being November 15th, 2019. Any and all payments received in the Town Treasurer's Office later than midnight on November 15th, 2019 will be considered delinquent and will be subject to the collection of interest at the rate of 1% per month, a fraction thereof for the first three months, and thereafter at the rate of 1.5% per month for a fraction thereof. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Article 11 is carried. Article 12, to discuss, excuse me, to transact any other business as proper to be brought before said meeting. May I have a motion? And a second. Article 12 reads to transact any other business as proper to be brought before said meeting. And just a brief comment on any resolutions or discussions brought forth that are asking the body for a vote. Be reminded that these are non-binding because they are not warned or informational certainly to the select board and whatever discussion you wish to have is welcome. So I'll ask if anybody wishes to raise any issues this, this evening. Looking at Chuck Reese. And um, <clears throat> I would uh, ask that we approve the following resolution as read by the moderator, because I'm having a little trouble seeing it. Happy to. Would that be fine? Thank you. The uh, resolution that has been presented reads, oh, that'd be wonderful. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Very much. So uh, on Chuck's behalf, I'll read. Whereas extreme and erratic temperatures and increasingly severe storms demonstrate that climate change is one of the most urgent problems facing our state, nation, and the planet, and whereas the state of Vermont and the town of Hinesburg have goals in the Vermont Comprehensive Energy Plan and the Hinesburg Town Plan to achieve 90% of its energy from renewable sources by 2050, yet is making insufficient progress towards achieving that goal, now therefore be it resolved, paragraph 1, that the town of Hinesburg urges the state of Vermont to A, halt any new or expanded fossil fuel infrastructure including but not limited to energy transmission and distribution pipelines. B, firmly commit to at least 90% renewable energy for all thermal, electrical, and transportation energy needs for all people in Vermont with firm interim deadlines. And C, ensure that the transition to renewable energy includes the reduction of total energy demand through energy efficiency measures. Paragraph two, that the town of Hinesburg will do our part to meet these demands by committing to the following. A, prohibit new construction of fossil fuel infrastructure on town-owned lands with infrastructure defined as a structure and ancillary facilities used to move fossil fuel from one location to another, such as natural gas or oil pipeline and other natural gas facilities. The exception being connections to individual properties that abut an existing fossil fuel pipeline. B, weatherize all town-owned buildings and schools and promoting programs and regulations that support all non-town owed buildings to incorporate efficiency and weatherization. C, install renewable energy generation technologies on municipal buildings when financially viable. D, pursue initiatives that would reduce the use of single occupancy vehicles while encouraging carpooling, mass transportation, and the transition to electric vehicles. E, strategically review all town government energy use and transition to new ways to provide necessary services in an energy sustainable way. Chuck, you're moving uh, for the motion. Do you have a second? Okay. So uh, the resolution on the floor, I will not repeat in its entirety, but welcome discussion. I believe most people may have received a half page with the language in front of them. Chuck, do you want to have a word? Uh, yeah, just a little uh, <clears throat> background on this motion. Um, this was presented to the select board um, <clears throat> a while ago at a meeting. And 
we worked with the select board to change some of the language in this. And this is actually um, has a couple of assumptions behind it. W one is that climate change is very real and that we need to do something now. And if you read any of the reports that have come out even more recently, um, we really do need a call to action. And we thought we would do this by demonstrating in the town with the town buildings that we can get these buildings to net zero. We're also interested in, in transportation. So th this is really a call to action. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm, our hope with the select board and the energy committee was to have a discussion here. Um, this is a advisory only, it's non-binding. Uh, but our hope is that this will be brought up again at a select board meeting, warned meeting, where people have the opportunity to discuss it once again, and then uh, we could take a vote there that is binding um, at a warned meeting. So that, that's our hope for this resolution. And I know it's getting late, and uh, I, I don't want to uh, open this up to uh, uh, intense, in the weeds kind of discussion, but I do hope that we can have some good discussion at this point. I would also like to point out that there is new data that shows that natural gas, if you include methane leakage emissions, is actually dirtier than coal. And on our uh, website in the Energy Committee, we will have information there for you to look at that too. So that's why we are concerned about putting money into transmission lines that are going to push this out further 20, 30 years when you put in a and a, a boiler or a furnace, that furnace is good for 20, 30 years. So there are options, there are affordable options that we can consider and our committee is also working on getting that information to the people of the town too. So I'm hoping we can open this up for discussion. I know it's late. How about Ray? <clears throat> um, I've given this a bunch of thought. I knew this was coming. Um, first off, methane emissions, part of the problem with natural gas is there's just too much of it. Uh, and as a fact, there being too much of it is a lot of times you just can't give this stuff away. A lot of people, the natural gas comes out of the wells and they just burn it right there on the spot. Uh, if natural gas were more valuable, uh, people would be, in, there would be an incentive for them to stop the leakage. Therefore, um, I think it would be a good idea that we install gas pipelines in town by using more gas in town um, it will raise the price of gas, although at, you know, a measurable amount, um, which would incentivize the gas producers to stop the leakage. Of course, we'd have to do, um, everybody would have to come aboard. Um, the next item being um, renewable energy. And, and so far, um, and I do agree that climate change is a big problem and we need to solve it. I have not yet seen any proposal to come up with um, the amount of energy needed to make us uh, put us on a, a renewable basis. Um, Vermonters have made it very clear that we do not want wind turbines in our state. Um, you've probably heard the expression, um, stick it somewhere the sun don't shine. And you've probably wondered, where is this place that the sun don't shine? And that place is right here in our beloved town. It doesn't, the sun just doesn't shine here in the winter. In fact, it doesn't shine uh, in all of the north, the northeast, the northwest, all winter long. So that's kind of um, when we need most of our energy here in Vermont. And uh, when uh, solar energy is least um, available. I find it very ironic that about 10 years ago, um, these same people came to us and wanted to, uh, proposed that we vote on shutting down Vermont's largest, most reliable source of non-greenhouse emitting energy, namely Vermont Yankee. I would like to amend this proposal as follows. In place of 3A, I would like to remove what it says and that, it, um, that the town of Hinesburg urges the state of Vermont to restart Vermont Yankee to supply us with non-greenhouse emitting energy. Is there a second for Ray's motion? 
Uh, hi, uh, my name is Bill Scott. Hold on. Hold on just a second, please. So at this point, you have an seconded uh, request for an amendment to the motion. And I want to clarify, Ray, where you're uh, reading th uh, uh, 3A. Are you proposing adding a third paragraph? I don't, I don't have a 3A on my version. So that we're all operating from the same understanding, what I'm hearing from you, Ray, is amending paragraph 1A to be stricken, is that correct? Yes. And in its place, the language encourage the state of Vermont to work to restart Vermont Yankee. I did hear a second. Motion on the floor amends the entire resolution to strike paragraph 1A and replace with the language, encourage the state of Vermont to restart Vermont Yankee. Is there any discussion on the amendment? On the amended motion, um, I would oppose that on the grounds of impossibility, and that um, at this point, Vermont Yankee cannot be restarted. It's well past its design lifetime. And regardless of how you feel of nuclear power, that's just not, um, it's a silly thing to ask the state. Um, regarding the four on, the, on what Heinsberg should do, even as a point of discussion, it concerns me that there isn't more here on return on investment um, I strongly oppose the idea of we must do something. We need to do the right thing. It's definitely true climate change is really important, but that doesn't mean that every dollar invested reduces carbon by the same amount. Um, and we need to take into account um, how the high, some of the things that have very high return, like um, ground source heat pumps, they also have a very high upfront capital cost, relatively speaking, um, anywhere from four to $20,000. And even if we do, even if that does pay for itself over time, that's quite a stretch for a lot of people. And um, I, uh, we should be trying. To, it should definitely be taking into account how the town can get the most, um, the most carbon reduction per dollar. That's all. Hi, I'm Rachel Smolker, uh, and I have been pretty firmly opposed to this pipeline from the get-go. Um, and I think there's another reason why we should be opposed to uh, expanding fossil fuel infrastructure in the town, and that is the issue of safety. Having looked in great detail and watched the construction of the uh, transmission pipeline through the state, um, you know, there's just a, a mountain of failures and systemic problems in the construction. And we're seeing pipelines that are exploding uh, on almost a daily basis around the country. And I would hate to see that happen in the town of Heinsberg. I myself have worked on issues around climate change for over a decade. I'm a reviewer for the International Panel on Climate Change, and I work for an organization that has been uh, opposing a form of renewable energy, namely biofuels and ethanol, because of the impacts on fuel, on food costs, and on land. So I understand uh, the very difficult decisions and the complicated uh, equations that we have to navigate. And we don't really have a lot of time to make that navigation. 
but I do know that there are certain things that we can clearly say no to. It's harder to know what to say yes to. One of the things in my mind that is very clear we need to say no to is the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure. So I support this resolution. I don't know, everybody's traveled all around the state, but the, um, one of the major fossil fuel pipelines in Vermont is the Portland pipeline, which carries fuel from Portland to Montreal, goes through the Northeast Kingdom. The, um, it, if it gets, when it gets rebuilt, it will almost certainly be expanded in capacity. This is just a point of order, but the point is that it saves the traffic of oil and fuel by ship all the way around up through the St. Lawrence Seaway. And that was why it was built, to save energy and to save, um, save transportation costs. And so not all pipelines are serving the role that um, the last speaker was, was speaking about. And this does address all pipelines. So I'm not sure that everybody's paid attention to the rationale behind everything that exists right now in the state of Vermont. We're in discussion mode. We're not yet to a vote. The amendment on the, is what is on the floor. Let's see, anybody else before Ray? Yes. Uh, hi, my name's Bill Scott. I'm, I'm also a member of the Energy Committee. I mean, I would like to just point out that there are immensely costly pipeline spills occurring in this country all of the time. And, and that provides these companies with plenty of incentives not to have this occur, and yet they, in, they seem incapable of actually preventing them. Uh, two, most natural gas in this country is produced in fracking fields by thousands of, of, of small producers and small wells. Uh, they have not stopped polluting the water, and, and they're very hard to regulate, and I don't think there's any, any chance that they are going to you know, mend their ways and stop releasing massive amounts of methane into the atmosphere. And these recent studies that have been done using pretty sophisticated measurement techniques, including aircraft measurements, have found that the methane emissions are far greater than anyone ever dreamed. And in a recent uh, a paper published recently in the journal Science, as Chuck mentions, it was found that these emissions are so great as to make over natural gas over its life cycle, not just on the combustion when you burn it, but from production and distribution actually becomes as dirty as coal. And uh, I, I don't think there's any, any hope of turning this around the way it is produced and regulated in this country today. Uh, Keith, I'm going to skip over Ray so that we get first uh, voices before hearing a second time. <coughs> Thank you, Frank. Uh, Keith Roberts, I want to call the question on the amendment. And then should that, uh, should we return to the original motion? I'd like to address that, please. Very good. Is there a second for Keith's? Very good. So motion on the floor now is calling the question. All in favor of ending debate on the amendment, please indicate aye. Aye. Any nays? The ayes have it, so discussion on the amendment ends. Now we vote on the resolution amended with the language of paragraph 1A stricken and replaced with the words, words encourage the state of Vermont to restart Vermont Yankee. All in favor of the amended resolution indicate aye. All opposed to the amended resolution indicate nay. nay. 
the amended resolution fails, and now we are back to the original motion on the floor, which is still open for discussion. Keith? I, I think the data show that if you want to travel somewhere, airplane travel is the safest way to go. It's far safer than automobile traffic. However, every time an airplane crashes, it makes the headlines. When people are killed in automobile crashes, it's buried at the bottom of page 27. Uh, sort of the same way with pipelines. Pipelines, the data show, are the safest way to move um, energy from point A to point B. Problem being, like airplanes, when there is a pipeline failure, it makes the news. When somebody's propane truck drives off the road and explodes, it doesn't make the news. When an oil truck uh, runs into somebody or overturns into some creek, um, again, it's buried in the, in the way. Um, in view of the safety of pipelines, um, I strongly urge um, that we do not accept the part of this um, motion dealing with pipelines. Thank you. Again, I'm Keith Roberts. I rise in uh, partial opposition to the motion, uh, somewhat along the lines of what Ray just spoke to. Um, the, the problem with energy consumption, one someone once told me, is you try to take the least bad choice. There are bad choices. There are bad aspects to every kind of energy use. Uh, and to me, the key word there is choice. Um, I believe climate change is real. Uh, I drive an electric car. It turns out it's wicked fun. But the reason I got it is because I think we need to move away from internal combustion engines. I have solar on my house. Chuck installed it. Uh, so, so I'm doing my part because I think that's the right thing to do. The problem that I have with part of this motion is the language in 2A, where understanding that this is a non-binding advisory motion resolution, it says prohibit things on town-owned land. So my problem with it is forcing people to do something as opposed to incentivizing them to make what many believe is the right choice. Uh, I also have concerns about that language because of something that we sort of talked about in the traffic discussion, the law of un unintended consequences. I know I've seen some discussion uh, on Front Porch Forum and I've had discussions with people today that they're concerned about the language that's in the resolution speaking about town-owned land except for what abuts uh, some existing property. And I would hate to have an unintended consequence of this paragraph 2A prohibit some homeowner or commercial property owner in the next however many years not be able to hook up to a Vermont gas line because they have to get an extension over some piece of town property to do so. And so for that reason, what I, I rise in opposition to paragraph 2A, and in fact, I would seek an amendment to, pro, to uh, strike paragraph 2A, but leave the rest of the motion in place. Is there a second? Okay. Before I get to you, Bill, we, as I understand it, Keith, your amended motion is to strike paragraph 2A altogether from the original resolution, is that correct? So the amended motion on the floor right now is as originally drafted in the resolution, but striking paragraph 2A. Bill, would you like to make discussion about the amended motion? I did hear a second from Lanny, yes. I'm Bill Marks. Um, like Keith, I'm not uh, an expert on the, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I, I'm, uh, not, not an expert on the, on the legal intricacies in this area of the law, but the, uh, pipeline group, which has been successfully, uh, challenged major, uh, safety issues, well, uh, is in the process, has, has, uh, 
uh, convince the Public Utilities Commission that the whole Vermont gas pipeline needs to be independently inspected, and that process is just in the beginning. Um, and in con consultation with their attorney about 2A, because I had concerns myself about its enforceability, um, and it is not, in fact, enforceable. Even if this was a Warren meeting, um, a town vote cannot change the effectiveness of the state statutes which regulate this area. Um, so at, at uh, the language prohibit could be amended to um, discourage. I would let somebody else if they would feel more comfortable with that. But the fact is, um, what this resolution would do would be help uh, the town to guide its policy. Now, the select board has um, authority uh, uh, in um, granting easements um, to utilities. That can be challenged by a petition, voters' petition, and a special vote. Um, but even the select board uh, decision, uh, should they choose not to, um, a utility could take, depending on the type of infrastructure, infrastructure involved, uh, it would either go before Act 250 Board of Review or the Public Utilities Commission. And so a utility could attempt to take the property by eminent domain, um, which the uh, select board can't stop. So the, the bottom line is, the short of it is, this is not, 2A is not enforceable, and therefore um, we don't need to worry about it restricting anyone's um, rights here. I think it's an important guidepost uh, for the town to demonstrate to the select board what we want and, um, and to simply um, use that as a guidepost. As I say, if somebody would feel more comfortable with changing the word prohibit to uh, discourage new construction, et cetera, um, I personally would have no problem, and, and I don't think uh, Chuck would either. Thank you. Further discussion? Well, we can, we can address that. Are you trying to make a motion, Bill, to reincorporate paragraph 2A and strike the word prohibit and in preference utilize the language discourage? And is there a second on the amendment to the amendment? Okay. So the amended amendment would now read as the original resolution with one change. Striking the word prohibit and replacing it with the word discourage. Any discussion on the amended amendment? Um, Chuck. I guess I would support the amended amended. I'd like to see that uh, 2A in there um, <clears throat> because it actually states our position as a town. And under Act 250 review, if I understand this correctly, if we state this as a town, that has to be taken into consideration. To remove it altogether, I don't think is strong enough for what we need to do in a timely fashion. And I would accept the word discourage and replace of prohibit. Further discussion? Andrea. Yeah, um, I guess I'd like to speak in, um, in favor. I, I, would be, I would be okay with the word prohibit. I, my main um, reason for supporting that is that while we all can be making individual choices and trying to do the right thing, I think there are times when it's very important for us as a community to take a stand and say that this is what our goal is. And um, that's why I am, would be glad to see um, 2A stay in there, whether it says discourage or prohibit. I think it's important to recognize that the state of Vermont uh, voted to ban fracking. And within 
couple of years, we saw the very strong um, push towards putting a transmission line, uh, expanding the transmission line, while we had all kinds of support for banning fracking in Vermont. And to me, that is just not recognizing the dangers um, of, of fracking that's happening to our neighbors in other states. And it's really important that we not be hypocrites. And if we're going to ban fracking um, in our state because we don't want our wells polluted, I think it's important that we ban the infrastructure that is allowing that fracked gas uh, to come through through our, our state. Um, so I'm in support of this resolution. Carl. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, uh, this is uh, Jeff French. Mm -hmm. So um, I like the word discourage. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, it, it's no matter how we vote, it's up for a conversation. And I think that's important rather than getting into the weeds about words and how things are written. Um, so I thank Chuck for bringing it up. Uh, one idea instead of discourage, and now I'm going to get into the weeds, is uh, leveraging some of our zoning laws. So for example, we could say encouraging new construction not to, or we could say de-incentivizing the use of fossil fuels, which means uh, leveraging regulations and zoning to, they could still do it, but it would come at a cost. So I guess my point is I don't want to change the amendment as it is, but I think we need the broader conversation and to go through all the options that we have uh, to make sure this is right. Thanks. Carl first and then Phil. Just a point of clarification. I thought there was an amendment to strike 2A and by Keith that was seconded. So are we able to change a word in a section that's been amended to get rid of altogether? Does Keith have to accept this as a friendly amendment? Or I'm just trying to clarify what we're going to be voting on because there's two changes to 2A. And I would like to see it stay as prohibited or um, as discouraged and scrap the whole thing. But I'm not sure how we vote on this because there's well, two I, amendments I, on the floor, it seems. I'm trying to go through my notes to calculate exactly how to accomplish that, Carl. And I believe with an amended amendment where we're discussing now, we come to a vote on that issue. The amendment can include or remove language as the body sees fit. If the amended amendment passes with a two-thirds majority vote, I do believe that implicit in that passing, Keith's motion would fail, and the original resolution would fail, and the amended amendment would carry. Does that make sense? No. Let me try to re-explain. Right now what's on the floor is a resolution that has been now amended twice. The only change to what was originally read from Chuck is changing one word, and that is at paragraph 2A, the word prohibit would be replaced with the word discourage. We go through the process of the body voting on that resolution. If two-thirds of you vote in favor of the what we're calling the amended amendment, that language discourage, then that is the resolution that would carry. And then I'm really unclear, and I need some help here, about going back to Keith's motion and voting on that, because that is illogical. That amended amendment supersedes. We have uh, an individual in the body with uh, near daily experience with parliamentary procedure, and I see his hand is raised. Bill, do you have a comment to make about the procedural well, aspect. Well, mine is a point of order, if you will. Please. Can, 
Can you explain? I don't think I've heard it explained, but maybe I missed it. Why it's a two thirds vote rather than a majority vote that's required. You've, you've now stated multiple times it requires two thirds vote. Let me look under this ruling the unruly, they call it. Not to suggest or disparage. You are correct, Bill. Majority vote. Thank you. Do we have a second? Okay. So now we have a two thirds because what we're looking to do is end discussion on the amended amendment. So all in favor of ending discussion Please say aye. aye. All in favor of continuing discussion, say nay. All right, so discussion on the amended amendment ends. And now we go to the vote, which I will ask on the floor, modifying the original resolution, replacing the word prohibit with the word discourage. All in favor of that resolution, aye. aye. All opposed to that resolution. It's sounding like majority vote to me favors the amended amendment. If anybody wants to divide the house and disagrees with my hearing, it sounded to me far and away majority in favor of passing the word discourage over the word prohibit. I'm going to call it as the amended amendment passes. Hearing no disagreement, I will reiterate that we are still on Article 12. If anybody wishes to raise additional other non-binding business. Please. No, what we've passed, what you've passed, is exactly what you have in your hand with one word replaced, discouraged as opposed to prohibit, at paragraph 2A. Please. Thank you for making that point. I'm appreciative of the help. I, thank you, thank you. One of the favorite things about moderator school, which I didn't attend this year because of a business problem, is this is your meeting. This is not anything about me, and I really do encourage it being raised and challenged. So now that we have an amended amendment, the resolution before the body to be discussed, I didn't get back to you, though, Phil. Did you want to make a point? Um, I think that we not go back to the original amendment, which Keith said, where he wanted to strike um, 2A? I don't believe that that's the proper procedure because okay. the majority of the body has requested to include that language that Keith moved to, mod to remove. So now we are at the point where we vote on the resolution itself as amended. So the resolution on the floor reads as read earlier with one modification, the word discourage in place of prohibit. All in favor of that resolution. Please say aye. 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 All opposed to that resolution, please say nay. nay. I hope that the select board will uh, voice their opinion if they hear differently, but I'm hearing majority in favor, aye. That's what I thought. So the resolution as amended passes. Any other 
business that anybody wishes to bring forth relating to Article 12. Right. Phil. Um, so um, um, I was in favor of this passing, and um, I'll, in, you know, what will now happen, and I think it's a great opportunity for the select board to ha continue discussions on this critical item, um, you know, for our town, our state, our world, um, and it's not an easy fix, and there's a lot of moving parts associated with it. Um, so I hope as a town we can continue to have those discussions, and, um, you know, it, it at some point is going to require us to look at how we do business. We talked about spending a lot of money salting roads and, um, you know, with some big town equipment. Um, and, you know, I question everybody to think about what this town will be like 50 years from now and how the town, um, not only the, how the people might heat and move themselves, but how the town will continue to operate. Because I would, in my opinion, say it's going to be very different. Um, and it will, we'll have no choice but to change. So now's the time for the town to look at how we do move forward and what changes we can make to make it easier and adapt to a different and changing world. Move to adjourn. Very good. good All deal. in favor? Aye. All opposed? Ayes have it. Good night. Thank you.